In a world full of distractions, there is one big question on every dog owner's lips. How do I become more than just the person holding the other end of the leash? We all get dogs with a dream in mind, a vision of the future. And if right now your everyday reality isn't quite that picture you had in mind, you are in the right place. It really doesn't have to be this way. You absolutely can and will be more to your dog than just the person who gets in between them and the world. The key is you need to be more sexy. More sexy than the neighbourhood cats. More sexy than the jogger in the park. More sexy than that half-eaten hamburger they just found on the floor. And yes, even more sexy than the dog across the road. I'm Tom. And I'm Lauren. Together, Together we're, we're Absolute dogs. dogs. And you're listening to the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Sexier Than a Squirrel podcast, the podcast that helps you to transform your dog owning struggles. Now we've had some questions and I think this is an awesome question and I thought what better place to do it than in our kitchen. Uh, So uh, it was appropriate and we've got multi dogs hanging at our feet and we've got food. And the question is, how about managing ditch the bowl in a multi-dog mm. household how does it work how does it work about mm. in, the, in the sense of actually how do they all get their food and fairly yeah. but equally how do i not get dog fights or mm-hmm. squabbles or problems and how do you even know what she had or what she had or what he had yeah. like how do we get this right yeah and i think first things first is really getting to understand your individual dogs because they won't all be the same and you know that might be quite extreme like um I, for example, bet gets less food than um, ketone, who is, ketone is my six kilo kilo. spaniel, bet is my 14 kilo border collie. The 14 kilo border collie needs less food each day, otherwise she goes, you know, she becomes overweight. And so when you actually kind of get to know the requirements of each of your individual dogs, you can kind of, we don't necessarily weigh it out every day, um, quite the opposite, uh, it's much more um, free than that. And um, and yet we're kind of aware if, you, if we're rewarding all the dogs, maybe I might make the effort to break up a bit of food to give to Bet, whereas I might not go to that effort if I were feeding Ketone because she needs a lot more for some reason. And I think the big thing here when we're managing Ditch the Bowl in a group of dogs is also to consider that actually fair doesn't mean equal. Mm. So just because let's say Brave gets a treat does not mean that everybody has to get one at the same time. And equally it might be that, I don't know, you give one dog a very large tripe stick and another dog no tripe stick at all because they've already had all their dinner. Fair does not mean equal. It doesn't mean they all get one equal portion each. 200 grams for her, 200 grams for her 200 grams for him it doesn't mean that at all Mm -hmm. it means look at her how much has she had today look at her what's she doing the rest of the day look at him how is he doing these guys are six he is two vice versa you know what it doesn't really matter what your um what what your daily amount should be fair doesn't mean equal Mm -hmm. and i think you have to look at the individuals and you have to work on it from the individuals Equally, and I think this is very important, both Tom and I, we've said it before, we'll say it again, we work over a seven day period with a dog. So mm-hmm. Bet might have a really busy film day with us. Yeah, so actually, she might get, you know, two two days of um, food allowance. Maybe even three. Maybe even three. Um, and for the next um, two or three days, she's probably gonna have really light in terms of food. Now, um, that doesn't mean nothing. What that means is that I'm probably gonna be a little bit stingier. She's probably not gonna get any filled bones or filled Kongs. A bit like you after Christmas. You know what yeah. the whole New Year thing is about. Like you have Christmas, you all get a little bit round, yeah. and then you kind of go, New Year, let's uh, New Year, new start, let's slim up a bit because you've kind of overdone it. Yeah. So we know that a dog like Bet or a dog like Blink or a dog like Brave apparently will eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, and actually then they need a day where they eat less and less and less and less and less, or yeah. we potentially end up in a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Next tip, and this is just kind of a real like multi-dog household 101 is there needs to be a really clear rule that if you are feeding um, one of your dogs or giving one of your dogs a long-lasting chew or maybe your dog is chewing on something that does not mean that the other dogs go up and lick their face and try and get it out their mouth and whatever else that's just 
you know, that, imagine being at a restaurant and as people walked past your table, they were picking Just things up off your plate. Tom's, like, I mean, Tom's I, face that would be is my like, worst nightmare, Tom right? and Matt are literally not the best food sharers anyway. No, I honestly, so... <laughs> I, I, I don't like sharing my food. I'd want to see a full medical history. I'd want to know when they last washed their hands. I'd want to see them washing their hands to check that they'd done it thoroughly enough. You know, they, there are a lot of rules before the you get to take thing, things from. Tom then, Tom <laughs> arrived at, uh, we were staying away somewhere basically there was a chip on the floor and then a bit of ketchup on a chair and that was it tom's like let's leave this establishment we are not staying here there's something here. about squashed food that it's freaks so me funny. out it's so funny um, and so you know there has to be similar rules when it comes to your dogs and like i well we've, both lauren and i have multi-breed households and like it would be potentially entirely typical of a miniature dachshund to run up to a, a a dog that was having something to eat and lick their face and lick you know lick their mouth if my miniature dachshunds did that to my working border collies, for example, that would be, there would be a communication breakdown there, right? That would not go well. And so regardless of the size, the breed, the personality, there is a clear rule that you do not go and lick the face of another dog when they, especially and when there's food around. I think we can take it even further and actually say, if they've got appropriate food manners, and I know that if you're listening to us, you can't see this, but I'm feeding one dog. And then if another dog wants to be involved, apparently no one else wants to be involved, which is great <laughs> um, because they realize where their spaces are. But for me, if another dog wants to be involved, no, they can't be up in that dog's face. And if I take it towards one dog, that means it is not theirs. Yeah. You are the hungry hippo today, Brave. And that, I think it's that, it's that ability to um, hang back and um, tolerate that level of frustration and disengage mm. because it's just not their business. So actually knowing, so here we've got two dogs very close proximity if i feed one he doesn't go to her it's not his right like it's not his and, and same for her if she's trying to go near my hand for sure but i'm like feeding her yeah and then I'm feeding him, right? And it's not hers. That's none of her business. She says it actually She's might like, be my business. It might be, it might be my business. But and, and the other thing I would say is know your individual dogs. Like I know these two. There isn't a side to either of them, even in resources. There's just no real side. No. I do have a dog with a side. Her name is Adventure. She is an adventure. She's called Venture and she's venturous. Actually, with her, I would say she's on a bed and no one's coming near that bed. And in that instance, you can get on that bed too. I would put the other dogs on the bed so I'd feed her to a bed. I wouldn't yeah. even let there be and a that, chance of head on head. That's the key is that a lot of you will be saying, well, how do I implement that rule? Well, it probably starts with implementing the rules for yourself, right? And, and, and you having some discipline with this. And that means that the food comes to your dog rather than your dog comes to the food, first of all. So if you want to reward your dog, well, if I was in a multi-dog household and I was wanting to really establish this, I'm gonna get up out of my chair and I'm gonna walk over to the dog that I wanna feed and I'm gonna feed that dog. I'm gonna go back to my chair, I'm gonna sit down. And if the other dogs try and get involved, they're not gonna get anything. So we're gonna head over to, to her a minute. So we're just gonna head this way these two are with me if anything i might drop a piece of food there yeah. reward her drop a piece of food there reward her drop a piece of food there so actually it's not valuable to her to come up to me mm. so i'm not even going to give her the chance to come up to me he's got a level of boundary games that even when not asked to hang out there because he was put there a little while ago he's kind of remembered he's supposed to be somewhere i've forgotten but he's still there so i might reward that decision as well and i'm taking that to his mouth she's a hungry hippo i've decided i know um, and so actually you can really see how they um a hundred percent um do get uh, what is theirs and what isn't theirs i think that's really important to acknowledge yeah next thing that you might then want to think about is again um making it clear what your dog should be doing if they come to get involved in the action maybe you say you, you hop up on your bed, I'm feeding you. And maybe when that maybe when that dog gets back to their bed, you remind them, hey, the food comes to you, the value comes to you. Um, and you might throw food over there. If you're not in the picture, and this happens, you know, in multi-dog households plenty, um, and you've got a dog that has a long lasting chew that they're enjoying in the middle of the floor. Well, first thing that we'd be thinking is actually we need dogs anchored if there are chews and so we'd ask them all to get on their beds and their own beds and have their chews but it let's say we we were relaxed and we'd um we'd not noticed and another dog goes to go up to that dog with the chew to be honest regardless of whether the other dog cares or not which most of our dogs don't care about having nope. things taken from them and um, we're going to just give a little attention noise call that dog that's approaching um away and just remind them actually you know what that's 
they, they may well be fine about it, but that's not the rule of the house, right? We don't, we don't approach them. We don't try and take things and we certainly don't lick their face. And I think that uh, you also know your group of dogs. Like Tom and I both know our group of dogs very, very well. And I would happily have them with Chews and I'm always gently watching. Same for Tom. Mm -hmm. And then I've got other dogs who I know that we couldn't even, I just wouldn't even try it. I'm mm. like, you're either in a crate or a puppy pen or you're behind a gate, but I'm not trusting you with, with them. It's just not appropriate because I know you're too volatile in what you do so I think don't ever think oh I wonder what would happen if mm -hmm. if you get down that I wonder what would happen if I think you're in a, yeah. a downward spiral there's probably a couple of layers you can add in to make sure you do know what happens if you're asking that the other thing and I think this is really vital in owning a, a multi-dog household and ditching the bowl know your you might need to come this way with me uh, body condition score chart so yeah. Remember, we're at the number five. You can all get a copy of this. It's very, very shareable. It could be on our Absolute Dogs page maybe today. I think that'd be a great idea. And it could also be alongside this podcast. Um, and I'd love you all to share it. We want them at a number five. The ribs palpable without extra uh, or extra excess fat. The waist observed behind the ribs when you view from above. And the abdomen tucked up when viewed from the side. So you can see that tuck. For me, when I'm looking at my individual dogs, some may get more than others because of this. And this is on a daily basis. I'm thinking, you've had quite a lot today. You've had a little bit less today. And it's on a daily basis, I'm adjusting like this. Mm. I'm not personally measuring out their food on a day-to-day -day basis. I am looking at their weight and feeling them. I will also weigh my dogs as regular as I can, as does Tom, mm. uh, so that I know roughly where they are. You can do that on home scales these days. Scales have got so much cheaper and so much easier to get hold of you don't even necessarily need some dog scales or your vets you can actually just weigh them with whatever you've got often and um, so look at what's available to you or what's close to you uh, if it is your vets definitely weigh them there as well whatever's less stressful for you and your dog so don't make it a stress but do keep an eye on that and equally um for me look at what they are today don't feed them uh for what the packet says look at what they are in a multi-dog household tokyo has more than brave mm -hmm. brave has less than blink now that's weird because blink six kilos right like and brave is is 13 or 14. you've got to look at the individual dog and you've got to weigh um your food measurement out in your head almost to say she gets a bit more he gets a bit less she he gets a bit more he gets a bit less you just look at them and you adjust it and the big thing is there is no fixed rule no one is going to tell you 330 grams a day other than the packet who's trying to sell you the food mm -hmm. yeah what you've got to do is you've got to look at the dog and go hmm, yeah could have a little bit more of that could have a little bit less of that actually i could probably add some more oils to her um, food because she's a little bit on the um, her coat's not as, as good as it could be whereas his is really good he needs nothing quite happy with him I think this is where in a multi-dog household ditch the bowl does work because you can be very very flexible very very adaptable and you don't need to stick to one thing you can really adapt it to the dog in front of you so when you've got that adaptation just right and when you've got the rules of the house really really clear you can have a really harmonious multi-dog household and you can optimize their behavior and their well being at the same time that was this episode of the sexier than a squirrel podcast this is a really common question so make sure to share this episode we will see you next time and remember stay, stay sexy. sexy stop right there game changer we have something very exciting to tell you about if you struggle with stressful walks right now so pulling your dog yanking your arm out of its socket just basically it's painful right now, it's a struggle that you want to transform. You want to go from pulling on lead like a train to loose leash walking prince or princess, and we've got a solution for you. It is just £27. It's a mini course that literally is going to be your zero to hero of loose leash walking. Day by day, we're going to be showing you the games and skills and strategies that you are going to need to implement to transform your dog's leash behavior in the next two weeks. This is a complete pattern. Package, you get to keep it for life yes for life and it's just 27 pound to you access it anywhere keep it for life no equipment required and all you've got to do is go to absolutedogs.me forward slash stop pulling and yes it is just 27 pounds game changers